Hi there. My name's Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and so far in EC34 Analog Electronics, we've treated current sources as magical things that we could just grab off the shelf. And while we have reasonable approximations to voltage sources in the form of batteries and regulated power supplies, reliable current sources are a bit trickier to come by and will require a bit more cleverness. In this lecture, we'll look at current sources formed with one bipolar junction transistor and possibly some BJTs wired as diodes. And not surprisingly, in the next lecture, we'll look at current sources with two bipolar junction transistors. Now, we've already looked at a circuit that we could think of as a current source. In the common collector amplifier, we create a current through the BJT, and the small signal part of that current is turned into a small signal voltage by multiplying by the parallel combination of RC and the load resistance. So, what if I just got rid of the signal? What if I just got rid of the input here? And, well, if I got rid of the input, I don't need this cap here. And, well, we don't need to look at the output here, so let's get rid of all this. And since we're not really doing anything with small signals anyway, we can get rid of all of this. And then I'm just left with this bias kind of circuit here. But remember that our bias computation didn't really depend on anything that was happening outside of the collector of the BJT. So why don't I just get rid of all of this stuff up here too and say that the collector current is going to be our output? So if I got rid of all of the stuff up here, I could replace this lowercase i with an uppercase i, and then just call that my output current, I-O. And now to figure out what I-O is, that's just IC, and I could use all of the material associated with figuring out the bias points for a common emitter amplifier, or actually this also applies to a common collector amplifier. I can use all of that math we derived before, to figure out what the current is. Of course, you have the reverse problem of the design problem where you have a desired current and then you want to choose your R1 and R2 and you want to choose your RE in order to get that desired current. If you go to Marshall Leach's ECE3050 website, 3050 is an earlier number for what's now called 3400 and scroll down to his notes on single transistor current sources, and then scroll down to his specific section on this one BJT current source, he provides a suggested design procedure. I'm not going to slog through the details of that here. It's pretty straightforward, and if you need a current source, you can follow it. Now, to figure out how good this current source is, we also want to think about the small signal output impedance looking into the collector. And for that, we can take our collector current here and plug it into the usual quantities to compute various small signal parameters. And in particular, we're going to use RO and RE. All right, so the output impedance is just going to be RIC, the impedance seen looking into the collector. And for that, we can use this nice formula here. And for this formula, we need RTE and RIE. Well, RTE, the Thevenin equivalent looking out of the emitter, that's just RE. Remember, when we're doing a small signal analysis, we will zero out all of our voltage sources. And we could then write this, where I'm just replacing RTE with RE. And RIE has a couple of expressions we could use. It's very natural to use this expression with RE. And for that, we need the Thevenin equivalent looking out of the base, which when I zero the independent sources, it's just R1 in parallel with R2. So RIE is R1 in parallel with R2 over 1 plus beta plus RE. We can then characterize our current source with a Norton equivalent circuit, with our current source IO and a parallel resistance little r IC. Now, this output impedance isn't spectacular. You would like it to be higher. And in the next lecture, I'll show you a current source with two BJTs that can give you improved output impedance. So this is a current sink that uses an NPN transistor. We can, of course, flip everything upside down and create a PNP version of this 
that acts as a current source. And all of the formulas still apply. You just reverse the current arrows, and instead of VBE, you use VEB. Now you'll see some variations on this design. One of them is to use Zener diodes to provide the voltage at the base. And usually you want to choose your Zener voltage such that if you look at your VBE, you're dropping something along those lines or more across RE. That will tend to help stabilize the collector current with regard to things like temperature variations. Although you are going to be inherently limited if you're using a one transistor design. I'm not going to get into the details of the analysis here. It's fairly straightforward, even if you include the base current here. And there's various sources that will have various suggestions for design rules. Another approach, instead of using a Zener diode, is to use at least a couple of diodes. And you could add more. You could use three, you could use four, you can use however many diodes you want. You are limited then to having an integer multiple of these diode drops. Again, I'm not going to go into the details of the analysis here. There's various sources with various suggested design rules you can check out. One thing you need to watch out for in designing with these current sources is that the voltages need to be conformal. Namely, all of your transistors need to be operating in the active mode. So that can be a limitation depending on how far you want to push things. The main thing I'm going for here is I want you to be able to recognize these structures when you see them on a schematic. A common thing that people will do with these kinds of current sources is to use them to drive current mirrors, basically making a more sophisticated current source. So imagine that the I.O. in all of the previous slides becomes IRF for a current mirror. So that then produces a new I.O. So a current source can be turned into a current sink with an NPN mirror, and a current sink can be turned into a current source with a PNP mirror. And of course, when I'm using the term current source there in that more limited sense to distinguish from a current sink, current sources in that more limited sense and current sinks are both current sources in the more general sense of the term current source. This is the data sheet for the 990 discrete op amp that's currently produced by the John Hardy Company. And this is popular in musical applications, particularly microphone preamplifiers. And if we scroll down a little bit, we can find the schematic. As a fun aside, I thought it might be interesting to take a look at this. The main thing I wanted to point out relative to this lecture is that we have a current source down here consisting of a couple of diodes for the biasing, and we have another current source here. So they have different resistors here, so it looks like they're trying to generate different kinds of current. And it's a little hard to see what's going on because the resistors here are drawn horizontally instead of vertically. But if you trace these up, you'll see they are going to the positive voltage supply. So the output is a push-pull stage. And here we have the emitter resistors for the push-pull stage. I think under standard operation, these diodes shouldn't be conducting. So these are probably some sort of protection maybe. These are not generally in operation, so I'm going to ignore those. Let's see, it looks like there's a voltage difference between the bases being provided by these diodes here. So that's playing the role of that VBE multiplier we looked at last time. But this isn't a VB multiplier, this is just a couple of diodes. And this whole chain is being driven by this current source down here. All right, so if I look at the other current source over here, it's providing the bias current for a differential amplifier. And this is very interesting because the emitter resistors for that differential pair have some inductors in parallel with them. That's something you can't do on an integrated circuit. And according to the paper associated with this that I'll show you shortly, this apparently helps with noise. So there you go. Let's see, before we go further, I wanna mention these diodes here are not normally on. Op amps in this particular kind of application are always used with negative feedback, and that should be trying to force the inputs to be the same voltage. But if the feedback isn't fast enough, you can get this really bad effect called latch up, and these diodes help prevent that. 
All right, so the differential amplifier actually has a current mirror load up here. So this is a simple two transistor current mirror with some emitter resistors to help with the output impedance of the mirror. And the thing to note here, this basically forms what we would call a primitive operational transconductance amplifier. And in general, we would think of this as a current output device. And in a synthesizer application, you would typically have a resistance here to turn that current into a voltage. But there's nothing like that here. You really just have a parallel combination of the output impedance of the differential amplifier over here and the output impedance of the current mirror. And that's going to be pretty big. So if you think about this current output as being multiplied by that kind of resistance and think about it in terms of voltage gain, it has a whole bunch of gain. But that's appropriate for an op amp, which is designed to have a whole bunch of gain. Okay, let me trace the signal a little bit. So here, let me think about the negative input here. So if we increase the voltage here, that's going to result in a current flowing down this way and a current flowing up this way. The current flowing down this way gets mirrored to create a current flowing down this way. So those two currents add and that's going to result in the voltage increasing here. I'm trying to make a distinction between the arrows I'm using to represent current flow and the arrows I'm using to indicate whether a quantity goes up or down. All right, so let's see. Q5 is basically a common collector stage. It's an emitter follower. It's a little hard to see because for whatever reason, they drew the resistor associated with it way over there. All right, so if it's a common collector stage that's an emitter follower that's acting as a voltage buffer, so the voltage is going to go up here when the voltage goes up here. Although I don't mean that the voltage here is going to be higher than the voltage here. I'm just trying to follow the polarity of the signal. All right, so now we're going to go through a common emitter stage. Now you're used to seeing a common emitter stage with a resistor out here. But here we're having some sort of active load basically being provided by the current source down here and these diodes. In any case, the common emitter amplifier is inverting and then so we'll have the voltage going down here and also be subject to some amplification through that stage. And then Q8 here is a common collector kind of stage, an emitter follower. So if the voltage goes down here, the voltage is going down here also. Okay, so that makes sense. If we increase the small signal voltage at the negative input and follow the signal through, we wind up with a lower voltage at the output. And if we trace things through with the positive input here, we would find the opposite. So the polarity makes sense. So this push-pull output stage has the bias current provided at the bottom and the signal injected at the top. Something interesting about this common emitter stage is notice that it is fully bypassed. So there's no attempt really to try to stabilize the gain and the gain of Q6 is probably going to vary with temperature, just as the gain of the input stage is going to vary with temperature. But remember, the name of the game of an op amp is that it has a ton of gain, and you may not know what that massive gain is, but you're going to use the op amp in a negative feedback loop to stabilize the overall global gain. Now, there is something interesting here because we have this resistor and capacitor in series that's in parallel with this capacitor. So they're doing something with frequency shaping here. I'm not sure what exactly. And for our small signal analyses that we've been doing, we've always assumed that these are shorts. But later in the class, I'll show you how to treat those more carefully. Okay, what else do we have going on? So this diode CR4 is not active in normal operation. This only conducts if something's gone to an extreme, and according to the paper that describes a SOP amp, this diode prevents Q6 from going into saturation. So you can ignore it in your standard analysis. Notice we also have this capacitor here. It's in series with this resistor. 
And I think what this capacitor is doing is it's rolling off the high frequency response in order to help with amplifier stability. In particular, notice that we have a negative feedback loop from the output of Q6 to the input of Q5. And I say negative feedback loop because Q6 is an inverting common emitter stage. And the capacitor is only going to pass high frequencies well. And remember, negative feedback lowers gain. Now, you may also note there is a feed forward path through here from the output of that operational transconductance amplifier kind of structure this direction. But the effect of that is going to be a whole lot smaller than the signal going this direction that's going through this big amplification stage. So people will typically ignore this feed forward path when analyzing such a circuit. And the only other components I haven't really talked about are this capacitor up here, but this is just filtering the power supply. That's not very interesting. Oh, and I do have an inductor at the output. So that is going to choke off high frequencies. So this is going to have some sort of low shelving effect. If you're interested in learning more about this design, you can check out this paper by the designer in the Journal of the Audio Engineering Society. And you can also check out this associated patent, but I personally find patents to be fairly painful to read.